here who have extended their cookie season. Everyone say hello to Reese, Troop 2027. Um, and so we wanted to reward everyone that's here for the ESG session. So we're gonna pass out these boxes. Please open, take one. More importantly, on your way out, buy a cookie, um, buy, buy a cookie box because these are very much our future female entrepreneurs and they're working really hard. So um, Reese, with that, why don't we pass these out? Okay. We're gonna pass these out. Okay. Okay, time to talk about, yeah, do some social good. We're gonna ESG the, with the Girl Scouts today. Okay, I'm Carolyn Detman. Um, I am, I have the greatest gig here next to Shelly because I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of the Female Quotient. Um, and I am thrilled to be talking about ESG. ESG is pivotal. Um, it's only grown more and more, piv more pivotal over the last couple of years. But I just want to level set before um, inviting our incredible panel to introduce themselves. Does everyone know what ESG stands for? Raise hands. Where's my, where's my audience with the cookies? Yeah, okay, so for the most part. Okay, good. Um, because, by the way, five years ago, maybe even three years ago, a lot of people didn't know what it stood for, and now it's become incredibly p pivotal. So what I'd like to do to kick us off is um, have you introduce your, your esteemed selves, who you are, who, what you do, and why don't you tell us why you think ESG is so pivotal right now in this moment? And so why don't we start here? Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Michelle and I am the founder of Clever Carbon and Women in Climate. So these are two climate projects that I have. I'm an entrepreneur, but prior to that, I worked in tech. I worked for big companies like Salesforce and DocuSign, so obviously ESG is at the heart of a lot of their initiatives. And I think ESG is so important right now because the private sector is gonna play a very important role in getting us on the other side of climate change and educating everyone around what we can do to make an impact. And so ensuring that these companies are playing a role, are educating and making an impact is so important right now. Okay, Ruth. Hi, my name's Amy. I'm the founder of a company called Good Loop. And uh, they say ESG funding globally is worth $35 trillion, um, which is a, a bit of a loose interpretation. That's about 40% of total assets under management. If you boil that down to just ESG-specific funds, uh, it, it's around $3 trillion. And I can speak personally to the value of that $3 trillion. Um, I have impact investors in, on my cap table, alongside corporate investors and traditional VCs. I also am the recipient of ESG funding and, and those impact investors have a seat on my board and represent the social lens or the ethical lens when we're making big executive decisions about the future of my business. So um, that's why I think it's so important. Ruth. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Ruth Yumtubian. I head up the VSP Vision Global Innovation Center. So you might be wondering, why is a vision care, you know, insurance benefits, uh, a company that works with doctors, obviously we have a supply chain uh, talking about ESG. Uh, and, and I think it's because corporates are taking notice and, and needing to go through a transformation. So why is it so important right now? I think for those of us who this was very intuitive, you're already on board, you're already doing something, you're already making decisions as business people and consumers. For those who are not, it's time to bring them along into the story and to have the kind of patience to educate and to maybe break down what is ESG and why is it important. Um, and so I myself have been in the innovation space for over a decade, but have been working um, at the cusp of sustainability and innovation um, for the past few years. So I've seen how this has become more and more important because when you use the best processes and materials, it means you're innovative, but it also usually means you're sustainable. Lauren. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lauren Leonard. I'm the president and CEO of a company called R3 Score Technologies. We modernize legacy risk models like criminal background checks. Um, I think the reason why ESG is important is because sometimes we forget the S in ESG, uh, which is inclusive of diversity. And so I'm excited to have a conversation because I think we limit diversity to um, really just kind of one definition. Um, but I think the ability to talk about workplace diversity, supplier diversity, all of the forms in which we can't just, you know, slap a title on it. And it includes everything. So I think it requires us to be intentional, which today where we are, if we all don't get in to fix the problems we have, we're just not gonna fix them. Yeah, 
Lauren, you, you actually just brought up something that I was going to talk about, which is companies seem to be much more comfortable in the E and the G, not so much the S. And so um, I'm going to stay with you, if we can, and talk about how you are measuring the S, because I think that, um, and I'd love to hear from all the panels how you're measuring in general, but particularly the S, because that seems to be the emerging area that is a little bit out of companies' comfort zones. Exactly, and I think the, so there is no clean answer because there is no standardized way to measure the S. And I think that's where we are in the squishy part. I think that's also why a lot of companies have been allowed to not answer the question, right? So I think it's forcing us to say, what will be the metric, what will be the standard? Because for some people, after the murder of George Floyd, there were a lot of pledges around racial equity and diversity. And so in my line of business, we got a lot of inbound calls because after about six months, they recognized, okay, but how do we actually do this? How do we operationalize this so that it's more than just a pledge? Um, and what they've come to find out, the easiest, cleanest thing to do is supplier diversity. Um, and so that is a new metric. It's ultimately, the, um, black women are the fastest growing entrepreneurs. They get 0.6% of VC dollars, right? So while you're growing, you have no capital. But I think there's also this element of, you know, when we talk about inclusion, we only talk about capital. We have to talk about customers. If you don't do business with black women, there are no black businesses, right? So I think that the, the metric is the right question, but there is no one size solution to the answer. Yeah, we, on an earlier panel that was not about ESG, but it was out, but about purpose, branding, and marketing, um, we had a woman talk about that they measure their purpose um, work based on uh, allowing uh, minority-owned businesses to stay in business, not go out of business. That is a metric that they use. And I thought that that was really something very interesting and different than what we've seen thus far. Okay, Ruth, how about you? How are you measuring ESG? Yeah, I, th I think I'm going to turn this around a little bit and just say that part of our journey has been educating and bringing the, this framework um, to an organization that's very complex. And I actually think that there are a lot of different um, measurements out there and ways to look at this. And I, I kind of prefer the UN sustainability goals because uh, companies can break down the whole idea of sustainability and social good and align to one of these um, uh, goals and do it very well and kind of hone in and just spread from there. So I've seen a number of corporations and, and brands align themselves and be able to go full force. When you have to look at the whole ESG metric from far, it looks very scary. We need more steps and progressions. The other um, area I'm actually very curious about what Lauren thinks about this is sometimes the S actually feels like it's stepping on someone else's toes. So we have a lot of DE&I officers who are not involved in the conversation on the E, on the sustainability, maybe on the governance side. And so do they feel like by implementing an ESG uh, framework that their toes are being stepped on, which begs the question, where does this even start in an organization? Where do, where do we start with the innovation team, with legal, with the DEI officer? So more, more questions than answers here. Listen, this is what this is all about. Lauren, anyone else on, on the panel, anyone wanna, wanna talk about that? Yeah. I think 100% that is, the, the S is extremely dirty, right? Like we just have no idea what to do with the S. And I think it's for that because each um, entity does it differently. So we sometimes are approached by legal first, Sometimes we're approached by hiring because they have a crisis in hiring. We then are approached sometimes by the innovation team because they went to a conference and they heard it. And I think that is ultimately part of the issue is there is no, no guideline as to if I want to do this and I want to do it well, how do I structure it so that it's embedded? Because technically ESG is designed to be a framework that's embedded in a company. Right now it feels like a thing that could fly by the night and if senior leadership changes their mind, they're not into ESG anymore, right? So I think that there's a disconnect be between what it was designed to do and how it's actually being implemented. Amy, how are you measuring? So we both consider ESG internally as a business. And um, in answer to your question, we are a B corporation. So we uh, e ESG is this sort of dirty, woolly thing that's quite open to interpretation. B Corp isn't. B Corp is a membership organization. You legally change the structure of your business to prioritize your social values at equal level to your financial return. And as a, as a 
founder and a director of my company, if we weren't a B Corp, my only legal responsibility is to return money to my shareholders. Whereas as the founder and director of a B Corporation business, I am legally permitted to prioritize purpose over profit. So, so that's the structure that, that we use. But we also um, are in the business of ESG. So we work, Goodloop works with big global brands and we help them do good through the lens of sustainability, diversity, and, and sort of civic responsibility. So it's a, it's a lot about helping them figure out which bits of it they want to kind of own, which bits they can authentically talk to, and then start starting somewhere. <laughs> Michelle, you're going to probably have a little bit of a different take on this because you come at it from more of a consumer perspective. So how do, how do you look at this? Yeah, I mean, I spend my time reading a lot of ESG reports. So whether Ooh. it's like tech companies, <laughs> clothing oh. brands, I want to know, you know, what are the emissions of a clothing brand versus a tech company? And in reading an ESG report, I go through all these different things to find the data that I need. And when I read an ESG report, I'm like, is this a pamphlet for, you know, uh, you know, to hire people, attainment, or is this like, is this for stakeholders, is this for investors? It's really confusing. So I want to echo what Ruth mentioned around the SDGs because there's 17 of them and it recognizes that there's not one social um, initiative that is going to get us to where we need. So one of the SDGs is peace and prosperity. You know, how as a company do you make an impact and how do you measure that? It's really difficult. But if you didn't know that that was something that you needed in the first place, then you're already lost. So if I could read a report and have a framework where I can go through and look at all the SDGs and see what is this company doing in this and you know maybe they're not targeting it this year, but then I can go to Climate Action, SDG 13, and find all the information that I need, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think sometimes we as, as corp, you know, companies, as consumers, you can get overwhelmed by the problem, the bigness of it, right? So I think where we get into danger and may potentially paralysis on ESG is if you think about it as, oh my God, you know, we're not going to be able to solve climate change. Like no company is suggesting that they're going to solve climate change. But what they are doing is they are saying, here is an ownable space within the environment that we can do better, that we can contribute. And I think we haven't gotten to that mindset yet on the yes. I'm going to keep coming back to the yes. Because people say, you know, we say to us all the time at the FQ, like, well, how are we going to solve the gender gap? They say it's going to be 132 years. No one company has to solve the gender gap writ large, but every company can do their part, and the ripple effect is what the magic is and what we should be measuring, right? So I think that's, that's where we need to see, I think, ESG go. So just to bring this down to, like, tangible, right? So can we, I would love to hear any examples of whether it's at your own, you know, your own places of business or just, you know, you're reading a lot of sustainability, report, uh, sustainability reports, ESG reports. Who do you think is getting the measurement of this right? Give, give us some examples so that we, we kind of can go off of those examples a little bit. Who has anything? No. Amy? Yeah. No? I can go. Um, I, I, um, I want to speak a little bit to a project um, Good Loop did that I'm really proud of. Um, and it's specifically on the E, sorry, <laughs> but um, <laughs> the least popular <laughs> of the letters. Um, but it's basically, we, uh, we've we always been a carbon neutral company, right? From the day I started the business, it was something that mattered to me, so um, it was something we did. And, um, and at the beginning, that was very much sort of finger in the air, throw some money at some trees, lovely old job. And as we've grown and got a bit more mature about it and learnt more, it's become more sophisticated. So um, about four years ago, we implemented a methodology to measure the carbon footprint of the ads we buy on the internet. Um, that's the main part of our scope three, which is the, the kind of the services we buy. We're a media company, so we buy a lot of ads on the internet. And um, I googled it. I googled carbon cost of buying an ad on the internet, and there was nothing. So we just made our own one up. And turns out we were kind of the first people to do that. And clients started asking us. It, honestly, I didn't even think of it as a, as a part of the... It sat on slide 10 of the pitch deck that I thought no one would ever look at. And we started getting clients about two years ago saying, how do you do that? How do you make carbon neutral ads? So we open sourced the methodology. We put it on our website. And it's a simple methodology that's sort of stealing from how they measure websites online. So it just looks at data transfer and then figures out how much electricity is used to transfer that data across the internet. And we open sourced it and overnight it became 
the most visited page of our website. And, um, and we opened Pandora's box, honestly, because the online advertising industry is very dirty. If you think you know, the internet were a country, it would be a larger uh, carbon footprint than, than the airline industry. If it were a country, it would be uh, the third largest emitter in the world. The internet is so dirty, and we don't think about it because we can't touch it, we can't hold it, you can't see trees being cut down, but you know, advertising percolates through that and leaves massive vapor trails. But by starting to measure it and then by open sourcing that methodology, I, I hope and I, th I think we started a conversation about our responsibility as an industry and I'm really proud to be a part of that. Yeah. And success begets success. So yeah. people see that. I, I'm a big believer in jealous sibling rivalry as a way to get people to, to do yeah. things. So they see you do that and then they, they do it as well. How about you? Yeah, I think, so I actually want to share an example of how you, you even start, because that's really the, part of the challenge here. Um, so within, and within my organization, you know, we, we're in an industry where we have a number of competitors that are starting to put out these different reports. And so I think it's important to first start with that landscape view of who's doing this well and bring that to life. But then it doesn't really mean anything to an organization unless you, you really show them what's possible. So borrowing from innovation methods like prototyping, um, our team put together what we call the sustainability showcase using different materials to create packaging. So we used mushrooms that you can plant back in the ground. Um, we used a number of uh, materials like coffee beans and we created eyeglass cases and we prototyped them and we showed, no, these mushroom materials are real. They don't just crumble right away. They're, they're sturdy. The coffee beans look more beautiful than most uh, cases. And so through actually prototyping this and bring this to life, it helped our stakeholders come along. And we have to remember that you have leadership that needs to buy in. In our case, we have doctors who are small business owners. This is far from the top of their list. We have consumers that we intuitively know will choose this product over another if it has sustainable packaging, but we have to get past that assumption. So prototyping is a great method to do that. And this exercise we did of prototyping five packages using different sustainable materials led to more buy-in and led to now um, packaging that is sustainable from across the company and it's scaled and it's owned within the business and not just the innovation center. Um, and this year our, our organization put out their first impact report. So the, something can start really small like prototyping, but you have to bring it to life and show what's possible before just looking at the scoreboard. Yeah. So A, congratulations. And, and B, you made it so tangible, right? With the eyeglass cases and everything else. I think there's a ton to be learned from that, Lauren. So I would say who's getting it right, I will give a shout out to our customers, uh, people who buy my reports. Um, partly because we um, have been helping businesses and governments and specifically in hiring and lending. Um, and these are companies that either because they just aren't reaching their business goals or because they are trying to honor their pledges are looking for alternative ways to identify talent and customers. So I'll just give you a, a use case. So there's a community lender, CDFI, um, in the middle of the country. They do loans to entrepreneurs who are unlikely to get capital from banks. Um, they specifically decided to focus on community members who were coming home from prison or jail. Um, and so I won't take a ton of time to explain why it's extremely difficult to get back into the economy, but you know, 77 million people, one out of three working adults has an arrest or conviction record. We will be on target for that to be half of all working adults by 2030, right? So this is like a third of the country. Um, and they decided, they made this pledge, like a lot of companies, they had this capital and they couldn't figure out the problem. So they engaged us and we assisted them with process improvement and then they used our reports to make loans. And so there was a gentleman who was a great worker Every time they ran the background check, he got fired. He finally just got tired of that journey. He decided to go to farmer's markets and sell cold brew. He became a local hit. He wanted to start a business. They called us. He used our report. He got a $50,000 small business loan, opened up a cafe, and has hired more people who are coming home from prison who also can't get jobs. So when I say that, it's because we talk a lot about circular economies. To me, that's a circular economy. It is, there is a person in the community who there but for whatever choice he made, he went to prison, he admits that he did something wrong, and his point is, I deserve the you know, sustainable development goals, access to a livable wage. Mm -hmm. And how do we make it so that a small business who wants to take the risk mm -hmm. has the tool they need to be able to do so? So to me, that's our customers are the people getting it right. 
And it's, I mean, again, it takes this very large kind of over, like could be paralyzing thing and it makes it so, it's very focused and very human, right? And people can relate and then you've got the math behind it and the math doesn't lie. So I think that's interesting. What about you, Michelle? I want to talk a little bit about the E piece because when people read reports and you know use a framework to measure carbon emissions, you know there's scope one, scope two, scope three, and that's pretty standard. But I want to give you know shout out to companies that are doing pretty innovative things. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Meta. I read their sustainability report and I was really impressed because they have infrastructure in place in their offices to measure water usage. Right, that is a huge part of the E, and we really focus focus on the carbon emissions a lot, and we don't really think about that. Another thing that they did is they measured their e-waste, and they have e-waste programs within their organizations to reduce the impact from that perspective, and I don't always read about that in reports either. Um, I also want to really give shout outs to companies that are bringing this information to their employees and including the employee engagement in the report, because I think that's really key. If you are doing all these things, and I walk up to someone at a company and you know at Meta and say, "Hey, like you know, did you know X Y Z about your water usage?" and they're like, "What are you talking about?" Then you know it's it's lost, right? Who is this information for? So I think the employee piece is really important, and I do see companies include employee engagement on ESG topics in their reports, and you know I think that's a great thing. So all right, let's go back to go forward. So ESG was on top of everyone's mind. It was sort of a huge priority, then the pandemic happens, right? And ESG takes a bit of a backseat, we would say. Um, then coming out of the pandemic, I mean, if you look at what's happening right now, it's, it, ESG is a little bit on the, on the attack. So I'm just curious to know where you think ESG is going from here, and why does it always seem to be on the attack, and how do we get beyond it? Oh, I have to start? <laughs> Anyone can start. Anyone want to take that? So I think it's, again, it's probably how we opened up with, which is when you don't have a clear definition of success or failure, those who don't want to participate use that as a reason not to, and those who do also feel paralyzed, right? And so I think that part of what I would hope we do is perhaps figure out what is, what is this, what are we all running towards, right? Because if not, we're all running. I just don't know if we're all going the same direction, <laughs> so. Yeah, okay, I think similarly to what I said when we, when we began this conversation is the storytelling piece and bringing others along because again, those who intuitively are um, wanting to prioritize the, the social or are, are kind of um, have the propensity to already ha want to include diverse voices are doing that. Those who want to make sustainable choices are doing it. I think now we have to bring in uh, and make it easy for another set of stakeholders. So the best example I have in my world is um, doctors and practices. And these are small business owners. They um, are part of what you might call a cottage industry where they're a bit fragmented and so they don't see the bigger picture. So if we can find ways to bring that big picture to them to show how they can benefit from um, having a more sustainable practice, bring them the tools, how they can measure, just make it much easier, then I think that's the moment we're at today. I, I don't think that um, people have taken their foot off the gas from this. In fact, I was involved in a project bringing um, a um, hip hop artist, uh, his uh, sound producer, uh, his name is Young Guru, into a conversation about economic growth using the SDGs. And you know, it was so interesting to hear people talk about economic growth that normally wouldn't and share their ideas. And so we have to bring them into the conversation first. We have to bring them the tools. So I think that next layer either needs the tools, the conversation, or the, the reasoning and path to come in next. Oh, I have a million answers to your question. And I keep changing my mind. I'm, I'm going to quickly say a few, real quick. Um, one, I think we need to make it way less complicated and confusing. Even on this panel, we've said UN SDGs, ESG, there's so many acronyms. Like, let's just talk about what it really is, which is the, the world is heating up, people are not being included equally and given equal opportunity. We need like, representation at the board level, in the, you know, the rooms of power to make change. Like, they're, they're, they're human, simple ideas, but we're wrapping them in complexity and I don't think that's the way to go. So, so that's the first thing. 
And um, the second thing is ESG specifically. I think um, we need to make it mandate. Uh, SEC is talking about making it mandatory within within the um, the filings, which would be huge. Same in Europe. There's some big ESG mandates coming out, which will just mean that. If you don't do it, you're left behind. And that brings me on to my third one, which is outside of ESG as a reporting framework, I think it just needs to be like more about action. More about action, more about the simple little things, celebrating each other's case studies, celebrating the stories, um, and yeah, kind of making it a bit more fun. Let's make it more fun. ESG sounds so boring, yeah. but what we're talking about is super important. Yeah, we like to we like to shout out when there's a t-shirt moment quote. That was probably it. Let's make ESG more fun. I agree with that 100%. All right, Michelle, last word. I mean, I think a lot of the times we think about, you know, budget cuts, you know, we're letting go of employees and it's really really tough in this environment like an environment in general, but there's more ways to contribute than to just give funds. You know, can you invite the uh, you know head of a nonprofit that you care about, you know, a cause to come speak at your company? Can you give your employees more time to do volunteer work? I think there's ways for us to get creative, and when you inv uh, invite your employees and get them engaged, they can think of ideas. Everyone, thank you so much. That was so helpful. Um, thank you to our audience. Um, and subtle PC, uh, PSA, the Girl Scouts, you can do some social good on your way out um, by buying cookies from our future entrepreneurs and future um, female founders and female executives. Thank you so much.